know, people always say to me, and I got it again tonight, who are some of your most favorite interviews? And I'm going to give you a quick turn of some of my favorites. And let's start, and you can applaud here. Let's start with the late, great Wilt Chamberlain. Give it up for Wilt while we have a chance. There he is. I had never met Wilt Chamberlain, this is a true story, before the year 1979. I come out of a restaurant in Santa Monica, California. This is true. There is a $300,000 white Rolls Royce convertible in the front of the restaurant. In the back seat, I am not making this up, are two Great Dane Dalmatian dogs in the back seat, as big as horses. In the, fr in the front seat is a beautiful blonde, I mean packed into a leather dress. Because, you know, let's face it, Will Chamberlain, <coughs> He felt he was the NBA's all-time leading scorer. And uh, I walk up to the driver's side of the car. I kid you not. And there is Will Chamberlain. I had never met him before. He's seven foot two. He's 355 pounds. He is wearing a silver and purple silk jump jumpsuit with a burgundy beret. He's got fluorescent scars, a tooled African belt, an African walking stick, and leather pants with wraparound tangerine sunglasses and a cigarette holder. <laughs> now, I, this is true, I walk up to Wilt Chamberlain and I say, Wilt, I, I can't believe I'm meeting you for the first time. I would love you if you could come do my show. He said, Roy, I would love to do your show, but right now I'm trying to keep a low profile. So. <laughs> <laughs> then we had Tommy Lasorda on our show. Give it up for 90-year-old Tommy Lasorda. He was trying to say that uh, when he, he was managing the Dodgers, there was a pitcher named Bert Hooten who got so worked up before the game they had to feed him fluids in his arm intravenously. Now, Tommy did not know the word intravenous. By the way, one of many words Tommy didn't know. I said, Tommy, tell me about your pitcher. I swear to you, he says, Roy, this young man has got a lot of courage and a lot of guts because he gets very dehydrated before every ball game. And they have to feed him fluids in his arm with one of those, you know, one of those, uh, one of those IUDs stuck in his arm. <laughs> so there was a pregnant pause there, as you might imagine. <laughs> then we had Shaquille O'Neal. Give it up for Shaq, Shaquille O'Neal. Look at this picture. <laughs> I interviewed Shaq one time. The Lakers lost the world championship, have lost it. Not won it, lost it. And ESPN wanted me to go out and interview him and get his emotional state after being defeated. They always do that stupid thing. I don't know why they do that. So it's two o'clock in the morning at the Palace of Auburn Hills in Detroit. And I walk up to Shaq and I say, Shaq, I hate to do this, but can you share your emotional state right now? Well, I'm a little pissed off. This was my brilliant follow-up. How pissed off are you? <laughs> he actually said, to the highest level of passivity. <laughs> I interviewed Shaq one time after the US Olympic team won the gold medal in Athens, Greece. It was a big moment for him. He cuts off the plane I said, Shaq, congratulations, first of all. While you were in Athens, did you have a chance to visit the Parthenon? He said, Roy, we went to a lot of clubs. I can't remember all the names. <laughs> and then there was Kobe. Shaq and Kobe did not get along. We, uh, we actually, we look back at Kobe and Shaq. This is one of their happier moments on court. <laughs> I, said, I said, Shaq, tell me the difference between your personality and that of Kobe Bryant. He said, Roy, that's easy. First of all, Kobe Bryant is a loner, but me, I'm a socialist. <clears throat> Karl Marx is spinning in his grave as we speak. I wanted to do a story with two teammates who were completely dissimilar culturally. So I went to the Houston Rockets basketball team in the NBA. I don't know if anyone's here been a Houston Rockets fan or they had a very eclectic team in the, in the 90s. So I started with one guy who was from Lagos, Nigeria. Soft-spoken and humble and graceful, spoke five languages, highly educated, deeply religious, very graceful man. 
Hakeem the Dream Olajuwon. And then I wanted to go with somebody completely different, so I went to Charles Barkley. Okay, so here it is. <laughs> True story, first question out of the box. I wanted to do offbeat stuff, so I said, gentlemen, Hakeem, Charles, do you believe you're going to heaven? Do you believe you're going to heaven? Olajuwon was very reflective, and he had this beautiful, lilting Nigerian voice. Well, I believe that my service to God is pure and consistent. And it comes from the spirit of giving in the community of all mankind. Yes, 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 yes. I believe humbly I will go to heaven. <laughs> I said, very nice. He said, Hakeem, how about you, Charles? Are you going to heaven? He said, I don't know, but it's definitely going to be a close vote. <laughs> we had Shannon Sharp do our show. You all know who Shannon Sharp is? Hall of Fame tight end from the Ravens and the Broncos, great player, wonderful guy. He's now on Fox Sports, as you may see him here and there. By his own admission, not the greatest student of all time. Went to Savannah State University. I don't know if anyone here went to Savannah State, but there are no Nobel Prize winners going out of there. I said, Shannon, based on your academic career, would you say you graduated to the level of magna cum laude? He said, Roy, the fact that I even graduated is thank you, Lonnie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a basketball coach, some of you might remember, in the back of the room here somewhere. Abe Lemons did our show. He was a guy from the University of Texas, wonderful guy, but he had a bad temper. And this is a story, the next time somebody in your life uh, really irritates you to the highest level of passivity, <laughs> You might remember this story. He gets a technical foul called on the basketball court as the coach. He knows that the second technical foul he gets will cost him an ejection from the game. So he knows whatever he says to the referee, he cannot afford, cannot afford to offend. And you might use this in your, in your walk of life. He says, hey, ref, referee, come over here for a second. He said, listen, ref, I got one technical foul. I can't afford to get a second one, but let me ask it to you this way. Would you give me a second technical file for something I'm just thinking? <laughs> Referee says, I can't give you a technical file for something you're thinking. He goes, good, I'm thinking you're some of a bitch. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> this is how it works. <laughs> remember the most eccentric interview I ever did? I certainly remember it. Was this guy right here. Remember the first time you heard Mike Tyson speak on television and you said there was something wrong with the audio on my TV, you know? It was after a fight, I'll never forget, it was one of the, a left and a right and another left and another right and it's all over! There's a new heavyweight champion of the world, Iron Mike Tyson! Oh my God, I feel powerful. I feel extraordinary. I have the perspicacity of fighting him. I don't know what to say. I know with a left hand or right. He went down like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> I did a show one time with Mike Tyson it was, and, and Michael Spinks. I don't know if you remember what happened in this one. And I have Michael Spinks coming on my show. And I said, Michael Spinks, it's one week away from the Tyson fight. Let me ask you to this way. Are you concerned at all about your way in? He said, no man, I'm concerned about the way out. So I knew. <laughs> we get to the fight. It's in Atlantic City, and I'll never forget it. Before the opening bell, they have the two fighters staring at each other. You know, they always do that intimidation thing, right? I swear, I'm so close to ringside, I can hear what he's saying. Mike Tyson looks into Spinks' eyes and he goes, Tonight, I'm going to beat the crap out of you. <laughs> and his opponent looked back at him and said, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the fight starts and it wasn't very long. This was the fight. He knocked Spinks out in 90 seconds. Oh. I could last 90 seconds. <laughs> and the most amazing thing happened, I swear to you this is a true story. I go to the press room. I'm running to get to the press room to get my seat because the fight is over. And this, I swear this is true. As I'm running, I hear a commotion behind me. 
I turn around, may God strike me dead. It's Mike Tyson and three of his handlers right behind me, not 50 seconds after the fight. He's not even broken a sweat. I look at him and he looks at me and he goes, oh my God, it's Roy Fyatton. How you doing? How is going on? Like I was at a freaking mall, you know? He goes, I, I said, Mike, congratulations. Oh, don't worry about the fight. I'll leave a few questions. I saw the show two weeks ago with your father. He was very good. He knew a lot about boxing. Would you do me a favor and tell him that I thought he was very, very astute and he had a lot of good insights into the sport and I really liked him very, very much and give him my very best. Now, my father hated Mike Tyson's guts. <laughs> but this is, not, this is not the end of the story. In those days, I went to a payphone. There was no cell phone. I call him up, wake him up out of bed. He's half asleep. Oh, Dad, you're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you. I'm at the Tyson Sphinx fight. Oh, that son of a... Dad, listen. Let me tell you what happened. I'm running to the press room, and Mike Tyson himself pulls me aside right behind me. He says, he saw your show. He thought you were fabulous. He thought you had a lot of great insights, and he wanted me to give you his best. Long pause. My father goes, well, you know, I'll tell you one thing about this guy. He's quite a warrior and one of the greatest champions we've ever known. You give my father a compliment, that's all he needed. <laughs> Still the greatest athlete, greatest boxer, greatest athlete I've ever been around, and we'll talk more about him later, is this guy right here. Give it up for the great champ, come on. And the greatest broadcaster in our generation was who? Howard Cosa. Do you know how many people these days, young people, don't know who this guy is? I, today, I had somebody say I'd never heard of the guy. Howard Cosell. I tried to explain to this kid that Muhammad Ali and Howard Cosell were like a, a tandem. They were like a, like a hip-hop group, really. They really were. In fact, if you put them together today, they'd have their own hip-hop record. It would sound like this. Today to view and observe a three-time champ with a hell of a nerve. He fought all comers with speed and savvy, though in later years he got kind of flabby. Ladies and gentlemen, Muhammad Ali. Howard Cosell, I hear what you say. You're full of hot air, you got a bad toupee. I fought with style and I fought with class. You ain't nothing but a pain in my ass. There it is, Howard Cosell. Muhammad.